I'm Charles Payne. I'm Martha McCallum. I'm Greg Jarrett. And this is the Fox News Rundown. Friday, December 3rd, 2021. I'm Lisa Brady. Testing, masking, and vaccination. Will it be enough again to fight COVID's latest variant or future variants? We have to learn how to deal with this. And uh, I think that's what you will see more people begin to do. We speak with Tennessee Senator Marsha Blackburn. I'm Chris Foster. A long era of labor peace is over in Major League Baseball. For now, there are no games to play anyway. If we get to Super Bowl Sunday and there's still in nowhere's land like they are now, that's a big problem. And I'm David Marcus. I've got the final word on the Fox News Rundown. With health officials on the lookout for COVID's new variant, it didn't take long for the first U.S. cases to surface. California, then Minnesota, then Colorado. All three of those cases fully vaccinated people with only mild symptoms. At least two had traveled recently in South Africa. But the Minnesota resident tested positive after returning from an anime convention in New York City. And local reports of cases there began to emerge late Thursday. We knew there'd be cases. Uh of this uh, of Omicron here in the United States, and it's here. But we have the best tools, the best vaccines in the world, and the best medicine, and the best scientists in the world. After meetings at the National Institutes of Health on Thursday, President Biden offering an updated plan to fight COVID heading into the winter. Testing is a big part of it, with tighter restrictions on all air travelers entering the U.S. All inbound international travelers must test within one day of departure regardless of their vaccination status or nationality. He says at-home COVID tests will be covered by insurance beginning next month. And masks on public transportation, including planes, will now be required at least until mid-March instead of ending next month as planned. But he's not imposing any new mandates or lockdowns. We have to learn how to live and to deal with this. Tennessee Republican Senator Marsha Blackburn. We don't need to go into lockdowns. We don't need to shut down our economy. People need to talk to their physician if they are a candidate to receive a vaccine. And some people are not, you know, because of medical issues, because of certain health or chronic conditions they have, or maybe a religious exemption. Uh, But uh, we have to learn how to deal with this and, um, I think that's what you will see more people begin to do. I know part of the president's focus is a bigger emphasis on testing, both at home and for travelers coming to the U.S. Health officials do keep saying, though, vaccines are really the best defense. Is there a way to get more people vaccinated aside from federal mandates, which are still well, tied up is, in court. Yeah, and I'm one of those. I am not anti-vax. I mean, a lot of vaccines have done much good work. I'm one of those. I get a flu shot every year. Not everybody, uh, a flu shot doesn't work with them. Yeah. So this is something that should be handled by the individual, not by federal mandate. And What we do know is testing can be effective. We know that there are some antivirals and therapies that are coming into the marketplace. Those should be a consideration there as we learn how to manage and handle this virus. In just a few weeks, the U.S. is expected to hit its debt limit again. I know Senate Republican leader Mitch McConnell has said Democrats should deal with that on their own. And then Democrats turn around and say, well, that's irresponsible of Republicans. Where does that debate go from here about the debt limit? With the debt limit, we have to realize that the Democrats have created this problem. They've been unable to organize themselves this year. That's why the National Defense Authorization Act is not completed. It's why they are having such issues with a continuing resolution and Biden's Build Back Broke agenda. They are not successful in pulling together a timeline for addressing the issues that are in front of them. And in essence, they are ineffective when it comes to leading our country, because right now they control the House, the Senate and the White House. This week on Capitol Hill, former Facebook employee turned whistleblower Francis Haugen was back. 
urging lawmakers not to get stuck at an impasse on changes to reining in social media companies. Um, she's urging limits on liability protections for the companies. She's also cautioning Congress about how to do that, though. Are you optimistic, especially given the current you know, political climate in Washington? Um, are you optimistic you can find that balance and actually get something done on that issue? Well, you know, we don't take policy advice from her by any means. And online privacy and data security legislation, Section 230 reforms, are issues that I have worked on going back to my time in the House. And currently, Senator Blumenthal and I lead the Consumer Protection Data Security Subcommittee at the Commerce Committee. Last Congress, we worked together when I led the Technology Task Force for the Senate Judiciary Committee. And we are hard at work on privacy, children's privacy, data security, and Section 230 reforms. And that legislation will be coming forward soon. Can you give us any sort of overview of what it will look like? It's many of the things I've talked about for years, having one set of privacy rules for the entire Internet ecosystem, one regulator, the Federal Trade Commission, uh, also being able for individuals, the individual user, to protect what I call their virtual you, which is you and your presence online, by having to opt in and give explicit consent. If you want to have your information shared and, of course, the ability to opt out of a platform remembering data mining or utilizing in any way your search history. I know something else you've been very outspoken about is China and the White House keeps saying it's trying to manage competition between the U.S. and China, but prevent competition from veering into conflict. Is it possible to do that and still stand up to Beijing? This administration would be well served to uh, get it in their mind. China is not a competitor. They are not a friend. They are not a frenemy. They are an adversary, and this administration is going to have to admit that and realize that. And I know President Biden felt like he could talk to his old friend, Xi Jinping, and could handle some of these issues. But what he is going to have to realize and admit is Xi Jinping is an authoritarian and is intent on pushing China as the global leader, removing the U.S. as the world's superpower and supplanting our place. What would you like to see the U.S. doing differently right now when it comes to China? The U.S. and this administration is going to have to be more strident with China when it comes to dealing with sanctions and holding China to account for their human rights violations. What is taking place there in Xinjiang province, uh, the genocide that's being carried out against the Uyghurs, the atrocities they've carried out against the Tibetans, the Mongolians, the way they have bullied Hong Kong, the way they are bullying Taiwan. The U.S. needs to say, no, we're not going to put up with this. We know what you are doing and we are not going to allow it. The U.S. also needs to be paying close attention to how China is trying to utilize the Belt and Road Initiative to extend their economic reach and also their debt diplomacy. I know that Europe, European countries, the EU, let's say, and the U.S. are coming up with investments that are supposed to help counter that Chinese Belt and Road Initiative, which is really the Chinese effort to connect Asia with Europe and Africa, um, as you mentioned, you know, expanding their, their economic reach. Do you think those coordinated efforts on the part of European countries in the U.S. will be enough to counter that or will even make a dent? 
I do think that they are significant and they are important. And let's start with realizing that our enemies need to know that they are our enemy and our allies need to know that they are our ally and that we will stand with them. And a part of this defense against China is true economic participation and partnership. And as you look at supply chains that need to come out of China, whether it's semiconductor chips or our microprocessors or pharmaceuticals or telecommunications equipment, these supply chains and these manufacturing lines should be moving out of China and working with our allies, having the opportunity to relocate these is something that is going to help us to not get into a crisis position with our critical supply chains. Most recently, there's been international concern about a Chinese tennis star who accused a former high-ranking government official of sexual assault. She wasn't heard from for a while after that, and even though she has since turned up safe, skeptics, including the Women's Tennis Association CEO, question whether she's really free. Senator Blackburn and fellow GOP Senator Tom Cotton are calling for a boycott of the upcoming Winter Olympics in Beijing. I I kind of like the way the Women's Tennis Association, the WTA, has approached this, and good for them. Because of of Peng Shui and what she has endured from the Chinese Communist Party and the way they disappeared her after her tweet went up, then the WTA has said they will not play tennis in China. And that's the right approach to take. More companies and more U.S.-based entities should take that same approach and deny China the ability to showcase themselves during these sporting events and these tournaments. Just one other question for you as we are here in the holiday season. Um, It seems like it's been kind of a fast year in a lot of ways. Um, What would your message be to the American people, especially to anyone concerned about the state of the pandemic right now and the state of the country? We still live in the uh, greatest country on the face of the earth. The United States of America is the beacon of freedom. It is a, a country and a nation that has been so richly blessed and protected. There is so much to be grateful for and to be thankful for. And our prayer during the holidays should be that we express that gratitude and that we remember well those that have fought for those freedoms and that we celebrate that and that we commit to doing our part to make certain that we are able to pass that freedom on to our children and grandchildren. Tennessee Republican Senator Marsha Blackburn, thanks so much for your time. Thank you for allowing me to join you. This is David Marcus with your Fox News commentary coming up. Major League Baseball is now in a labor lockout. Management's version of a strike with their collective bargaining agreement with players expired and talks ending with no new deal. Commissioner Rob Manfred. We feel it's the best strategy to protect the 2022 season for the benefit of our fans. We made the mistake of playing without a collective bargaining agreement in 1994, and it cost our fans and our clubs dearly. We will not make that same mistake again. Players went on strike during the season in 1994. The World Series was canceled. Then the season started late in 95 once a deal was reached. The sides have worked out agreements four times since then, but the players' union is fighting for change. The players for years have made it clear that they believe that the economic system was not working, that more radical, more drastic changes were necessary. Jared Diamond writes about sports, particularly baseball, for the Wall Street Journal. And the owners, not surprisingly, believe that the status quo is going pretty well and we don't need to make these big changes. And that's a big problem when you have two parties that are looking at the landscape and see two completely different things. And that's why we are where we are, where the two sides are still incredibly far apart. They've been there's been virtually no movement on the core economic issues. And 
uh, it might be a while before they start speaking the same language. I mean, revenues have really skyrocketed over the last, what, 10, 15 years. I mean, and it's hard to measure the pie. The owners aren't exactly known for being open with the books. That's very true, especially because nowadays so much of ownership revenue uh, is coming from, say, the real estate ventures around their ballpark, which uh, are not counted as baseball revenue, but very clearly are related to their ownership of baseball teams. And we don't really have a good sense in most cases of the revenues owners are making. What we do know is that franchise valuations continue to skyrocket. We've seen over the course of the last CBA, even a franchise like the Miami Marlins, uh, which you know is probably one of the among the lowest valued teams was sold for over a billion dollars. So if that's the case, imagine how much uh, a team like the New York Yankees or the Boston Red Sox would be valued if they were to go onto the market. The players, meanwhile, are still making lots of money and in some ways, especially the star players. We just saw that this week with some of these giant contracts, but it's not going to every player. And that is really the heart of this issue where uh, the league believes that this is an issue of distribution that there's a wealth gap in baseball and they're willing to sort of take money from the high end players and give it to some of the younger players. The players want a bigger share of the pie altogether. uh, And that's where we are. To get a little inside baseball here, uh, you mentioned the wealth gap. What's happened is management's gotten smarter about not overspending on aging veterans. They they, they realize, oh, we shouldn't be paying for what a guy did. We should be paying for what a guy's going to do. And these younger players haven't gotten big paydays yet. So... What do the players want to happen here? If you get more money to the younger players, that makes the the expensive veterans look less unattractive, if you get my drift. Exactly. It's an interesting point. And I, I think the players, and I, not I think, I know, the players understand why owners, or rather general managers and front offices armed with these mountains and mountains of data analytics, are recognizing that these older players are maybe not as valuable. And there's a bunch of reasons for that. We've seen the aging curve sort of revert back to something a little bit more normal in the post-PED era, or at least in the testing era for for steroids. We're not seeing guys that are 35, 36, 37 years old put up the numbers they were in the 90s and early 2000s. The players understand that, but their argument is, okay, we have a system that for a long time worked because players were accepting the fact that they would be underpaid early in their career in order to be perhaps overpaid later in their career. That was the trade-off, and it worked very well for everybody, except now, maybe smartly, the the front offices have said, all right, well, we're not going to pay you early in your career because we don't have to by a collectively bargained agreement, and we're also not going to pay you later in your careers because we don't want to. So the players are saying, well, now we're taking it on both ends. It has to be one or the other. Uh, so one of the things the players is pushing for is trying to get players paid more sort of in line with their performance early in their careers. Uh, but the problem for the players is that they also don't want to take away this idea that a star player can get a $350 million contract. So that's sort of the give and take that everyone's working with here. How do we get players paid younger while still protecting the interest of the very, very, very high-end superstar who has not been negatively impacted at all by this squeeze on free agents. Now, teams share national TV contracts. They have their own you know, MLB app for streaming money. And some teams, though, have really big local cable deals or own their own you know, regional sports network. Some just don't, though. And that's a bubble overall that could burst as more people cut cable. Is that a concern with these negotiations? Or is there a plan to get in on more streaming money team by team going forward. It's an issue for sure. There's a big disparity, like you mentioned, in some of these deals. You look at a team like the Dodgers, who whose TV deal is just uh, so exorbitantly high. And then you see some of these teams now that are still trying to figure out what their future is going to be, especially in the wake of the sale uh, from which was Fox, then to Disney, but then Disney had to sell them ended up now uh, with Sinclair and and you have this Valley network of, of of RSNs and sort of unclear what the future of those are going to be. You have these issues of uh, streaming, the blackout issues with streaming is a big one that Major League Baseball is very focused on. 
So for the owners, this is a, a very big, big deal. This is such a huge part of where their revenue comes from these days. It's not from gates like it used to be. It's from these local and, of course, the giant national TV deals uh, as well. So it's, it's a big issue. It's, you know, it's one reason why you're seeing so much talk about an expanded postseason, which I think is all but certain to be part of the new CBA in some capacity. Uh, because that's revenue that basically all goes to the owners. They really, really want it. And it is a, a, a rare piece of leverage for the players where they're able to say, we'll give you the, the expanded playoffs that you, we know you want, which you know, realistically is hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars into the owner's pockets. You can argue it either way, expanded playoffs for the players. You could say, um, OK, well, it's easier to get to the playoffs, so we don't have to spend as much on the you know maybe more marginal aspects of our roster or you could say geez we've got a shot to get into the playoffs maybe we should spend a little more money at the margins that's the interesting thing about all of this is that the, the owners really want expanded playoffs the players are not opposed to expanded playoffs they never have been i would say what they are is sort of unsure because what they're trying to figure out is what is that sweet spot where does it cross over what is the right number of teams that inspires competition as opposed to undermining it. Because you could look at other sports. We could look at, say, the NBA, for instance, where 16 out of the 30 teams make the playoffs. And in that sport, realistically, if you're one of those bottom playoff teams, you have no chance of, of advancing. You, they go into the first round against the number one, number two seeds and get blown out of the water. It's a total waste of time, and there's really no benefit to making it. In fact, there's probably a benefit to not making it for some of those NBA teams. Baseball players do not want that, but they do like the idea of a playoff system where teams are going for it. I mean, one thing we've seen in recent years where baseball started this sort of one game play in the second wild card, uh, players would argue in some ways that had a negative effect, the one game play in, because what happened was teams sort of said, well, it's a one game playoff. It's a 50, 50 crapshoot. It's not worth, us you know trading away prospects and spending money to go for that one game uh so they would argue that system hasn't worked so maybe there's a way to change it it's just a matter of figuring out on from their perspective what is it the owners proposed a 14 team postseason uh the players have proposed 12 currently it's 10 we'll see where they end up uh, i wouldn't be surprised if we end up at 12. jared you don't expect this to get resolved immediately um there's just no sense of urgency right now. Do you think that a sense of urgency kicks in as we get into February and spring training? You know, maybe we lose a week of spring training, but I can't imagine anybody wants this to go into the regular season. Yeah, I, I've been telling people about this. Like, if we get to Super Bowl Sunday and they're still in nowhere's land like they are now, that that's a big problem. A lockout in December and January doesn't really matter. It, you know, you could argue it's sort of part of the process. No, no one's really being affected. No fan is really being affected. There's tons of other sports out there. Uh, if we get, though, to spring, you know, into February and there's nothing, then you have a problem. But, look, the thing is, that's also what's going to start motivating people, right? I mean, the owners start losing gate revenue. of Those cactus and grapefruit league games are not happening. The players, of course, would start losing their money uh, you know, on March 31st when opening day is supposed to be. They're smart people, and I want to believe, do believe, that they recognize that missing part of the season is not good for anybody. It's a, it's bad. It'll be really, really bad. So hopefully, as we get closer, that starts motivating them to, to make a deal. Like you said, I don't think we're going to see anything anytime soon. Uh, in fact, uh, this is speculation. I'm not saying this. Can, I've been told, but I'd be surprised if anything really happens in December. I think we're kind of going to get a big lull here and. Then we get into the holidays and then New Year's and then they'll say, let's come back in January. And hopefully then they sort of get down to it and are able to figure something out. Because like I said, right now they're not really talking to each other. They're sort of just talking over each other. At some point that's going to have to change. And uh, I really view sort of that first weekend of, in February as uh, that's when things get serious. Well, either way. Hope to talk to you again in a couple of months uh, and, and uh, see where we are. Jared Diamond writes about sports for the Wall Street Journal, focusing on Major League Baseball. Jared, thanks a lot. Sounds great. Thanks a lot. I'm 
Guy Benson. Join me weekdays at 3 p.m. Eastern as we break down the biggest stories of the day with some of the biggest newsmakers and guests. Listen live on the Fox News app or get the free podcast at GuyBensonShow.com. Rate and review the Fox News Rundown on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen. And now, some good news with Tanya J. Powers. An overdue library book is back on the shelf at the Boise, Idaho Public Library. Now, before you start to wonder why this is news, consider this. It had been checked out for more than 100 years. The book, New Chronicles of Rebecca by Kate Douglas Wiggin, is the sequel to the novel Rebecca of Sunnybrook Farm. Both of those books were published in the early 1900s, the first one in 1903 and the second in 1907. The folks at the Boise Library say that book had been checked out a total of 15 times before it went missing from Boise's Carnegie Public Library in 1910. Photos shared by the library say it appears to have been checked out in 1911. At that time, overdue books would have been fined at a rate of two cents per day. If you do the math, you'll find that at that amount, for 111 years, the fine would have been more than $800. The Boise Library System did away with overdue book fines in 2019. And if you're wondering who brought the book back, well, so are the rest of us. A library spokesperson says the person who returned that book has not identified themselves. Tanya J. Powers, Fox News. It's time for your Fox News commentary. David Marcus. What's on your mind? As President Biden announces a slew of new COVID restrictions, it's worth taking a look back at the failures of the cast of bunglers and bumblers he has put in charge of what we can and cannot do. It is a shameful record that strongly suggests none of these people should be in charge of an Arby's drive through much less our pandemic response. Dr. Anthony Fauci, the self-appointed emperor god of science, taking a lot of heat these days, and for good reason. It's not just his cavalcade of mistakes over the past two years, but also his refusal to accept any criticism of himself as even vaguely legitimate. But honestly, the problem is far bigger than Fauci. In fact, the entirety of President Joe Biden's White House COVID task force has been an abysmal disaster, and it's time for a change. The task force is led by Jeff Science and features CDC Director Rochelle Walensky and Fauci as the scientific faces of the operation. Let's take a look at the havoc they have wrought. In early May, the CDC quietly announced they would stop tracking breakthrough cases that did not lead to hospitalization or death. At the time, experts warned this was a terrible decision. Why? They feared it would leave scientists blind if a new variant emerged. That is, of course exactly what happened. By August, as the Delta variant was surging, Fauci would reverse course, telling Meet the Press, we need to do more testing of the vaccinated. In fact, at that point, nobody in the task force or at the White House could answer just how susceptible vaccinated people were to the new strain of the virus or how much they could spread it because they hadn't bothered to track it. Now, as the Omicron variant looms on the horizon, another abject failure of the Biden task force has become clear. Whatever one may say about the excessive nature of the marathon task force press conferences of the Trump era, every question was answered. This task force instead holds Zoom pressers often as short as 25 minutes with few questions and even fewer follow ups. The result is that the citizenry through its news media has been utterly unable to effectively interrogate the ivory tower elite scientists apparently making huge decisions about our lives. Had the task force allowed its feet to be held to the fire by the press, many of the mistakes could have been avoided. Instead, a steady lack of trust has taken hold. Americans are needlessly confused and and have been almost since the moment Biden took the oath of office. Transparency has been replaced by shut up and do as you're told. From the border to Afghanistan to the economy, it is clear that Biden has no desire to punish incompetence. It is hard to imagine what, if any kind of disastrous mismanagement, could get anybody in the administration fired. But as regards the task force, change is needed, and it is needed today. We need transparency. We need competence. We need real press conferences. Put simply, we need wholesale change in the scientific leadership of our pandemic response. More than anything, we need a task force that does the research and tells us the unvarnished truth not whatever they think will bend our behavior to their will. Until that happens, this national nightmare will never end. I'm David Marcus, the author of Charade, 
the COVID lies that crushed a nation. You've been listening to the Fox News Rundown. Rundown. Stay up to date by subscribing to this podcast at foxnewspodcasts.com. And for up-to-the-minute news, go to foxnews.com. From the Fox News Podcasts Network. I'm Ben Domenech, publisher of The Federalist, and I'm inviting you to join a new conversation with the smartest thinkers out there about the country and where we're going. Subscribe to the Ben Domenech Podcast. Subscribe and listen now by going to foxnewspodcasts.com. Love Fox News? Click the subscribe button to get more of the news and opinion you trust. And click the Fox News Rundown playlist for the latest episodes.